Uh, I would like to introduce Galit Natpornik. I hope I pronounce your name after 10 years of knowing each other. It's always a struggle. <laughs> Sorry for that. I did good, good. So Galit is going to be our keynote for today. And uh, she's not only a, a super successful executive uh, here in Finland, but she also happens to be the founder of International Wealthy Women of Finland. And today we are 8,100 people, <laughs> more or less. Uh, mostly because she had that great idea three years ago to start this organization. So, welcome Galit, and uh, I'm going to be giving you the mic and switching over to your presentation. Can you hear me now? Ooh, much more powerful. I will project. Um, thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Nava, for the incredible opportunity to be here today. I can tell you when we founded IWAF three years ago, we would never imagine to be in such a space with such a beautiful audience, a live streaming, a platform, a gorgeous event with executive represented sponsors of the highest of calibers. This is uh, unbelievable. And yes, I think it deserves a massive high five. Caroline gave me credit for founding IWAF. I don't take the credit because I actually give it right back at her. When we founded IWAF, it was more of a reaction to the data point you shared. But the thing that actually scaled it was Caroline and people like herself who said, we need to do something about this. We need to leverage that platform, that space, that discussion. And we want to be visible. We want to reclaim the narrative of what it means to be a woman, an executive, and international talent in the workplace in Finland. So thank you, Caroline, once again, for an amazing work, and to all the volunteers. But today I speak as a regional vice president for an American company, but located in the Nordics. And I can speak to the day I get the role. And people look at the photo on the assignment for the Nordic head, and they're very surprised, because apparently I didn't look the part. But it didn't matter to me and it didn't matter to my employer because they saw the potential and they saw the hard work and the accomplishment that I was uh, privileged to, to speak to in my career in Finland. So what I wanted to do today is not speak about the difficulty of being a woman executive in Finland. I'm not here to tell you how hard it is, you all know. I'm not here to tell you what you need to do in order to succeed because you're doing it, right? I'm here to equip you and everyone on the line to speak about the reasoning of having women in the workplace. And you'll be surprised because it's not always about the story that you hear. Women are not always about the diversity. And as we can see in the audience today, they can sometimes be about the majority. So let me go forward and I will spare you some headache. Okay, when I was preparing this presentation, I made the horrible mistake to Google women executive. Don't do it. It's so depressing. <laughs> you get the most cliche picture of a woman with cross arm looking very stern. And then if you read the headline, it's always about how to overcome the challenge of the workplace. The statistic of lower number of women in executive position. Soft skills you need to be a leader in an executive position as a woman. Very, very outdated, sad, cliche content. I showed it here for you because the other horrible, sad fact is when you look at a woman leader, she has that superhero cape in the background. Unrealistic, frankly, and annoying. So what am I gonna talk about? I'm gonna tell you about why and how you should have women in the workplace. But I will tell you also what are the wrong narrative and mythology to having women in the workplace. One of the mythologies is that women are representing diversity. And I'll show you statistics, but you already know it. We are not diversity. We are 50% of the world population. Take it or leave it. Diversity is not a gender conversation. There is the capability to represent diversity of thoughts, of background, of ethnicity, of abilities, 
of age, you name it, we can bring part of that. Diversity is a wider context. Women are not diversity. We are citizens, we are employees, we are not your quota. And I think it is a wrong reasoning to bring women in the workplace. Another myth about having women as executive employees and retaining them is that they're so kind and we lead with heart and we have empathy and we're a good team leader and good team player. I mean, come on. When are we gonna stop genderizing behaviors? I've had super kind male leaders. And I've had badass women leader too. And some, you know, just plain mean. But that's not the point. You cannot associate those kind of traits to women leadership. I disagree with it, I will not play along. A third horrible cliche about women in the workplace is we can multitask. We're so good. We are mothers and executives and women. We have that gift you don't have. So I'm sorry to tell you women who use that as an argument to be better in the workplace, multitasking is a myth. It is proven by multiple health societies and agencies that it reduces by 40% your productivity. It is not a gender trait. It is not something you should brag about. And it is simply not a female trait. Don't use it. Ready for the last one? Did I destroy all of your belief system? What is she going to talk about? I have no idea. So don't multitask, by the way. Oh yeah, my favorite one. I've heard countless times, gentlemen and ladies alike tell me, I hire more women because they work harder. They can prioritize better. They're better system thinker. I think women are just plain smarter. Come on, that's crap. You cannot say stuff like that. These are not good rationals to hire women in the workplace, to retain them and to promote them. Women are just plain better is a crap argument. All right? So now I'm destroying all of your talk track. <laughs> I hope that's not what you're talking about afterwards. But if you are, let's talk about it. Let's have a debate. So now we've destroyed the idea that women are diversity, that they're better at multitasking or plain better at whatever you want. Facilitating, that's the other one I heard. That women, you know, in general, are kinder and lead with the heart. When we've established that none of this is true nor genderized, why should we have women in the workplace? What is the benefit? What is the advantage? And why should we retain them and promote them? So we're business people here, we're executive. So let's talk business. First of all, why should you have women in leadership position? Because we're already there. We don't need to wait for anyone. There are women that are politicians. They've been for years, decades, sometimes centuries. There are women who are engineers, doctors, artists, thought leaders, philosophers, doctors, business, leaders and executives, founders, board members. All right? We're already there. Not having women in the position of power means you're missing a fundamental set of skills that is already proven, tested, working for some of the most successful businesses, governmental institutions in the world. Just be smart. The other one is fascinating to me. I went to the rabbit data hole and, you know, got really obsessed with Finland demographics. And that's what you can see. And trust me, I went through all the data. It's true. It's verified. The fascinating fact is, if you remember what I said about women not being diversity, because we represent 50% of the population, that is an established fact. Check out what's happening in 2017. The most visible and living population in Finland will be women over the age of 85. That is interesting. If you're a business, you'd better cater to her. 
because she's going to be around for a long time and she's going to make buying decisions that impact your organizations and your margin and your share prices and whatever else you're monitoring. So if you're already in the business of catering for those ladies, well done. If you're not, you know, call me later. So that the population is actually women getting older, living longer, in, in healthier lives. That's not all. What is fascinating to me is that on top of this, the purchasing power and the spend capability is increasing over years. So there is a data point that comes from the US. I double checked with the Nordics and Europe. It's slightly lower, 75%. But I thought it was an interesting data. 85% of the total spend of a household is informed by or decided directly by a woman. 85%, that's enormous. From a business point of view, women are making buying decision. They're choosing where the money goes. As far as I'm concerned, that's good enough data point for me to make sure they're happy. This is the projection for Finland. These are data for Finland. So you can ask me later the source, but they're also in the bottom there. Why it matters is that people buy from people. If you do not understand how to speak to your consumer, how to address their need, how to anticipate what will come forward, you are missing potentially to consume from 31.8 trillion dollar market cap possibility. Even a percentage of this for any business is an enormous, enormous opportunity. When your companies, your organizations are building, offering product, services, concepts that are decided by 85% level by a woman, should we have something to say about it? Well, you know my bias. Yet. I mean, it's in Finnish, right? But it speaks for itself. And that's how you put the picture. Caroline, you spoke to the 51 place for Finland. That's embarrassing. That is embarrassing. I was looking at this data thinking it cannot be possible. Yet, publicly traded companies in Finland today have a position filled by women. In the case of chairperson of the board, 7%. 93% of chair men are men. That tells you something interesting because that cascades. Board members, slightly more, but still an embarrassing 30%. Remember, we are 50% of the population. I'm pretty sure in this room, you all qualify to be on a board. Should we do something about that? There you go. How about CEOs? Another fascinating data point. CEOs, decision makers, from the executive highest part of an organization in publicly traded company, 92% are men. Why is this important? Obviously representation. But the other part is, from the top of the organization, drizzle down the recruitment guidance, the expectation of what leadership looks like, and the opportunity to bring happier, healthier organization. There is data points, I won't bore you with all the numbers, there is all the stats in the back end around the happier employee statistic to have a higher gender diversity and diversity in general in the workplace. As we all know as leaders, happy employee, engaged employee, happy consumer, happy employees, happy business. Simple as that. That has an impact on your return on assets, up to 4%, which is a fascinating number, and a 12% return on equity for companies with a higher rate of diversity on the board, executive team, and decision maker part. Think about the buying power when the pay gap decreases. GDP increases. Capability to purchase more from that 85% decision maker increases. It's just sound business. It's sound business. So when I talk about having women 
in position an organization in Finland. I am not talking about, please be nice, include us. Just be smart. This is what your competitors are already doing. So when I'm equipping you today to go speak to that, do not use the cliche that I spoke earlier about. Do not speak to multitasking, diversity, kindness, and whatever. Speak to business, speak to leadership. We're already here. The future is not female. I never liked that sentence. I find it embarrassing. I have a son and a daughter. The future is equal. It's equal because it's a business imperative, because it has real impact on society, because diversity is not a gender conversation, it's across all of the visible and invisible minorities. And it speaks to our society, it speaks to our future, and it speaks to us. So thank you very much. Have a fantastic afternoon.